that there's a lot uh, to be said. So Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 1, the Bible reads, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of, uh, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and besieged it. And the Lord uh, gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with, uh, with part of the vessels of the house of the house of God, which he carried into the land of, of Shinar to the house of his God. And he, uh, and he brought the vessels into, uh, into the treasure uh, house of his God. And the king uh, spank unto Ash, uh, Penaz, the, the master of his uh, eunuchs, that he should bring a certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding uh, science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and, uh, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the, the king's meat and of, of, of the wine which he drank. So nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names uh, for uh, he gave unto him Daniel the name of Bel, uh, Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Me, uh, Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might, uh, might not defile himself. Now God, uh, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse likening, uh, liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make uh, me in danger endanger my head to the king. Then uh, said Daniel to Malzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, and I, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our uh, countenances uh, be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, as thou seest. Deal with thy servants." So he consented to them uh, in this manner and proved them ten days. And at the, at the end of ten days, their countenances uh, appeared fairer and fatter in, in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Then uh, thus uh, Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave, uh, gave them uh, knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days that the king had said uh, he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them uh, in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them, and among them all was found, no, all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, therefore, uh, therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians, uh, than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued even unto uh, the first year of King Cyrus. And so when we look at Daniel, obviously, to me, Daniel is uh, one of the most exciting books in the Bible. It's probably one of my uh, more favorite books you know, to read. That doesn't necessarily mean that I always understand everything that's going on in the book of Daniel. 
but it is one of the most exciting books that I see. But oftentimes when you hear the name Daniel and it's talking about the Bible, most times people think of Daniel in the lion's den, right? That's usually the first thing that people's uh, minds go. But, how, but we, should know, uh, we should know also that Daniel, the book of Daniel, is also a book of prophecy. There's about, the, the first half of it is historical, and the second ha- half of it is pro- uh, prophetic. A quarter of the books uh, in the Bible are of prophetic nature. One, uh, one-fifth of the content of Scripture was predictive at the time of its writing. A large portion of, of that has been fulfilled. Therefore, the prophecy in Scripture can be divided into the fulfilled and the unfulfilled prophecy. We will find a great deal of fulfilled prophecy in Daniel. The main subject of prophecy is the Lord Jesus Christ. Other topics include Israel, the Gentile nations, evil, uh, Satan, the man of sin, the great tribulation uh, period, and how this world will end. The church is also a, a subject of prophecy. However, the church is never mentioned in the Old Testament. And therefore, uh, there will be no reference to it in the book of Daniel. uh, Then, of course, there are subjects of the kingdom, the millennium, and the uh, eternity's future. These are all obviously great subjects of prophecy. These are all things that, uh, that we can look at or go through. But as we study the Bible, we need to have understanding of prophecy. We need to have knowledge of Bible prophecy, and we need to be able to study prophecy. The failure to study Bible prophecy correctly has produced many false results, which are clearly evident today. Many of the cults have gone off, uh, off, the, off track in prophetic areas. This is largely because the teaching of prophecy has been neglected by some denominations. And for the fact of different cults, the reason why they don't understand it is because they're spiritually discerned. They're not saved in the first place. And that could probably be said of some denominations as well, that they, they don't know Bible prophecy because the people that are trying to, uh, to do it are not saved themselves. They uh, dismiss it as a wave of the hand and as being unimportant. And those uh, who do go into uh, the study of prophecy often come up with that which is sensational, uh, sensational and fanatical. The book of Daniel particularly is the subject of many such sensational writings on prophecy and so this morning or so this morning this tonight i'm already ready for sunday apparently but tonight what we're going to do as as we're, we're starting this new series is the fact that we're going to be looking at the background and the introduction to daniel so that way it kind of sets up the rest of our you know the rest of the study as we go through it and so you know tonight like i said going to be background it's going to be an introduction of what was happening what was going on all that kind of stuff like number one is the date of the writing when was daniel actually uh, written the book of daniel uh, you know according to its own testimony is the record of the life and the prophetic revelations given to daniel daniel is actually one of the the most honorable most godly most uh uh, uh one with the most integrity and character that you're ever going to read Daniel is not one of those ones you know, that is constantly you know, fighting against sin or anything or temptation like da- uh, King David is or King Solomon or any of those ones. Daniel uh, actually is very, very, uh, he, um, he, makes, he minds how he looks to people around him. He doesn't want people to think you know, ill of him. He doesn't want to go around. I'm not saying that King David or any of the other ones I've mentioned said, hey, I'm just going to go around. I don't care what people think of me. But Daniel is especially, as we read in verse uh, verse 8, it says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He purposed it. It's something that we have to do. It's something that we have to make sure that we're going to do. Next week, I'm going to go into a little bit more of Daniel chapter 1. But the fact is, is that that's, that one verse is going to kind of set up the rest of what you see in the book of Daniel is the fact that he purposed, he, he, he made a special note in, you know, in his mind and his heart that he would not de- defile himself. I mean, even so much that whereas a king said, you have to eat my meat and my drink, and Daniel says, you know what, I don't want to defile myself. Is it okay if I you know, don't do that? He actually goes up to the king and says, I don't want to do that. Why? He's following the law of Moses. He wants to make sure that you know what God has told him to to do and to not do, he wants to do that. Like I said, he says that he purposed in his heart. 
And Daniel is a, he's a, a Jewish captive that was carried off to Babylon after its first conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 605, uh, 605 B.C. The record of the events extends to the third year of Cyrus, which is uh, five, uh, 536 B.C., and accordingly covers a span of about 70 years. So you'll see Daniel uh, is a teenager when, he's, uh, when, this, uh, when the book starts, and by the time he's done, he's in his 80s. And so it's, it's going to span his entire life. You basically get to see his entire life unfold in, in the 12 chapters that we have of, uh, of his life. The book of Daniel obviously is a very important one, and it has, been, uh, it, it has, it has therefore been the object of a special attack by Satan. It is a battlefield between faith and unbelief. So many times people will read Daniel... And for one thing, the first six uh, chapters of Daniel, they'll look at it and say, well, that's an, these are nice stories. These are nice fairy tales. These are nice things. I mean, because obviously in there you're going to have not only Daniel and the lions then, but you're also going to have uh, Madrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. And you're going to have all these different you know, stories of, of what's going on. People say, well, that's a nice fairy tale to tell. And so they, they go on because you know, these are all good, nice, little Christian you know, uh, kid you know." tales in which I sit there and I would say, okay, who would want, what parent would want to tell their kid about, hey, there was one time, you know, where, you know, uh, a man was doing God's work. His name was Daniel. And God said, because you're, you know, you're following my word so well, I'm going to throw you in a pit with lions. Yeah, that's a n- nice little fairy tale, isn't it? Something that you just want to, you know, a nice little bedtime story before you go to bed. Because I don't know about you, but if, I, you know, if I'm a kid hearing that story, I'm like, well, that, Daniel's going to get torn apart by some lion. And obviously we know that not to be true, but it's one of those things that you know, people always want to try and um, they always want to try and make an excuse for. But the Bible, as we found out last week, they are willfully ignorant of things. They don't want to know. Okay? And so, but it's amazing that how, you know, it's amazing how that we'll believe everything in a history book with no questions asked, right? I mean, we can go and get our, our books from, you know, from public you know, school and everything else, and we never ask a question. But when it comes to God's word, it's attacked over and over again, isn't it? No matter what. Why? Because the truth will always be attacked. But the book of Daniel has been under attack when it comes to the dating of the writing. There was a, a man, his name is, uh, is it uh, uh, Porfar, uh, Porfar, Porfiry, sorry, Porfiry. He was a heretic in the third century. All right, A.D. He declared that Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel was a forgery written during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes and the Maccabees. Uh, the Maccabees. That would place it around uh, 170 B.C., almost 400 years after Daniel lived. Do you know the reason why he, pl- uh, he placed it that far away from like 400 years later? It was because of the fact that Daniel's prophecies were so accurate. He said, there's no way that somebody could have wrote this 400 years ago, uh, you know, prior to this time period, you know, uh, 400 years you know, before 170 B.C., because nobody's that accurate. Well, Daniel, Daniel's only writing what God told him. Okay? Daniel's only writing what God, God had told him. And uh, so this guy, like I said, wants to, you know, uh, his, he wants, you know, uh, people to believe his, uh, you know, he wants people to believe his unbelief. Because of the fact, because he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want the Bible to be true. And so he, if he can, you know, get you to doubt a book in the Bible like Daniel, then he can get you to doubt any other book too, right? And so it's interesting, like, how these questions are raised about uh, concerning the Bible that are, always an- uh, that are always answered in time. The heretic, the critic, and the cultist always move in an area of the Bible where we do not have full knowledge at the time. I mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago about the fact that people say, well, there's no, that's a nice story about the walls of Jericho uh, tumbling down, but there's no evidence for it. Well, a few years ago, they found, that they found the evidence. They saw the fact that the walls were you know, literally pushed down into the ground, and all of a sudden they're going, oh, wait, that story's true. Like I said, the Bible is always true. Man is always wrong. <laughs> you know, you always question what man says, but you never question what God says. Amen? 
And so, you know, everyone can, can, can speculate and, and you, you know, if you want to, you know, you can speculate any way you want to, but generally the speculation goes the wrong way. However, in time, the Word of God is always proven accurate. It, it's always going to be accurate. So it's better to just trust and believe what you have in your hands, that that's the Word of God and that's 100% accurate, than for us to sit there and doubt what God's Word says. Because doubt, God's Word is always going to be true, no matter what. Right? Some of you may have heard of a, a man, by, you know, his last name is Josephus. He was a Jewish, a Jewish historian. He recorded an incident during the time of Alexander the Great, which supports the early authorship of Daniel. When Alexander's uh, invasion reached the Near East, the high priest there went out to meet him and showed him a copy of the book of Daniel in which uh, Alexander was cl uh, clearly mentioned in the book of Daniel. And Alexander was so impressed by this that instead of destroying Jerusalem, he entered the city peaceably and worshipped at the temple because of how accurate the Bible is. These are stories you're not going to hear about you know, at school or anything else because why? They don't want the Bible to actually be true. They don't want actually people to, you know, to realize that. And obviously, number two is the fact of the author of Daniel. We, we believe that it is Daniel, even though that Daniel doesn't speak of himself in the first person until chapter 7. There's little question that, Daniel, uh, uh, that the book presents Daniel as the author. One thing for us to also realize is that in chapters 1 through chapter 7, it's written in Aramaic. Why? Because they were in the land of the Chaldeans, and the Chaldeans spoke Aramaic. All right? And so then it, it, the, latter the latter chapters are written in Hebrew. And so that will you know, come into play a little bit as we, you know, as we begin to go through it. You'll begin to see why that's important. But Daniel stands out as one of the greatest men in history. Some would say just Jewish history, but I would say one of the greatest men in history because of his, um, of that staunch stance that he takes to the fact that he's going to follow God no matter what. Okay. And some people say, well, he's a he's a you know he's a fake person. Well, if you want to, uh, you can write down this one and check this uh, verse out later. Uh, Ezekiel chapter fourteen, verse fourteen. which says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Jacob, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their own, uh, sorry, by their righteousness, saith the Lord. And so we see, obviously, that he's a real person. Some people were saying that even, not even Daniel is a real person, that he's a made-up character. Just everybody wants to doubt what God's Word says, all right? Or, uh, you know, even the people that, that are writing it. But Jesus called, uh, called the Pharisees hypocrites, but he called Daniel the prophet. So Jesus, and here's the thing, Jesus never like, goes back and reverses course. He never goes back and says, you know what, I, I said the prophet, but I should have meant you know, the heretic, or I should have meant the hypocrite. or I should've got, you know, Jesus doesn't do that. Why? Because what he says is true, right? And so if you want to look that one up, you know, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. And Mark chapter 13, verse 14, says the same thing. Whereas he calls the, the Pharisees hypocrites and he calls Daniel the prophet. But the thing is, is the, the fact that Jesus Christ endorses and, and validates Daniel as a prophet, that should be sufficient for everyone, for every believer. That if Jesus says that Daniel was a prophet, we should believe that Daniel was a prophet, right? And we know, uh, we know more about Daniel uh, the man than, than most of any of the other prophets. He gives us a personal account of his life from the time that he was carried into captivity in Babylon to the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, which is about right, right around 606 B.C. until the first year of King Cyrus, which is about the year uh, uh, 536 B.C. Daniel's life and ministry bridged the entire, uh, the entire 70 years of captivity. At the beginning of the book, he is a boy in his teens, and like I said earlier, at the end, he's a man in his 80s. So the thing is, is that for somebody to sit there and say that, you know, that nobody can ever use, you know, God can't use kids or teenagers or anything else, Daniel is obviously a, a great example of saying, you know what, God can use whether you're young or whether you're old. It does not matter. 
And the thing is, that's obviously why the Apostle Paul says, don't let anyone look down upon you because you're young, but set an example, right? And so <clears throat> God's estimate of, of the man Daniel is this. He says this in Daniel chapter 10, verse 11. He says, Daniel, a man greatly beloved. That's what God has to say about Daniel. I mean, how many of us in here would love for God to say that about us? I think all of us would, you know, love for, uh, you know, love for that. And I don't want to be one of those, you know, one of those critics who, who call the, the book of Daniel a forgery. I mean, someday I'm going to, you know, I'm going to you know, face Daniel in heaven and find that he has, you know, that he has a good re reputation. Why? Because it says that he's a man greatly beloved. Can you imagine the fact that, you know, of, of you trying to explain how, you know, this person didn't exist, this person or whatever, you tried to like all that, and then if you were to meet him up in heaven? I can guarantee you that Daniel's going to come up if somebody says that about, you know, them and somehow, uh, somehow or another they're saved. I can guarantee uh, Daniel's probably going to walk up to him and go, I'm a real person. I wrote that book by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But if we want to characterize Daniel's life into three words, it would be this. Purpose, prayer, and prophecy. Purpose, prayer, and prophecy. As I said earlier, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. This is also in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It talks about the fact that Daniel was a man of purpose. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. That's the man that Daniel was. He had purposed that in his heart. And we know that when the, that, uh, the king made, made the decree that everyone had to eat the same thing, Daniel and his friends decided that they would abide by the law of Moses, and they did. Daniel was a man of purpose, and we can see that all, you're going to see that, that all the way through this book. I know that you know, tonight it's like I'm reading off the paper and everything else and whatever. Like I said, I want to kind of set the ground, you know, work before we actually get, you know, uh, into that first. But Daniel was a man who stood on his own two feet, and he had the intestinal fortitude to speak God's word. Because you know that there are some times where God tells uh, people in the Bible to do something, to say something, and they question it, whether or not they should say it, Right? But Daniel's not one of those ones. He says, you know what, if it's God's word says it, I'm going to do it. If God tells me I'm going you know, to do it, I'm going to do it. I'm not, by no means is Daniel perfect. But like I say, he's one of those ones with extreme integrity and character. I mean, God, you know, God should have pity on a lot of men today who claim to be his messengers to the world but haven't got the courage to declare the word of God. There are so many ones that stand up in the pulpit every Sunday, Sunday, Wednesday, week in, week out, and will, and will censor what God's word says because of the fact that they don't want to offend somebody. Daniel is not that man. Daniel is one, uh, that one that will stand up, and I, I thank God that there are many who are declaring the whole counsel of God, including prophecy you know, in our day. But the, pro uh, you know, the, the proper study of prophecy will not lead us, should not, and will not lead us to sensationalism or fanaticism. You have some people out there, you know, they just go nuts over prophecy. There's a reason why Bible prophecy conferences are like the, like the number one attended event among Christians. It's because you have everybody, you know, coming up with their own interpretation of what it says. But you know what? God's word doesn't, you know, muddle the waters. It says actually, you know... Uh, what it means but the thing is is that it will not lead us to those things that i talked about sensationalism and fanaticism but it will lead us to a life of holiness and fear of god that's what prophecy is supposed to do is to say you know what i'm gonna you know live holy for god because i don't know i don't know when the lord you know is coming right and I was talking about this, you know, this last week, you know, with my, uh, with my daughter about the fear of the Lord. Because some people say, well, it's not the fear of the Lord. Uh, believers shouldn't have the fear of the Lord. Yes, they should. They, why? For number one, in Proverbs, it says that the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, right? I mean, think about it. Those that you respect the most, you also fear in a way. 
your parents, there is a fear of your parents, isn't there? And you respect them the most. The thing is, is that you know that they love you, that they would die for you, that they would do anything for you. But you don't cross them because something's going to come, right? And that's the same thing is, is that, that it should drive us, you know, to know that God at any moment can say, you know what? I mean, because there's times in, in Scripture because somebody decided that they, they did not want to follow God, that they, didn't, you know, uh, that they didn't want to follow what he had to say or do what he said, and what does God do? He takes them out early. Because for him, he's like, well, for one thing, he says, they're saved, but I'm not going to have them like people you know, having a bad view of me, so he ends up taking them out soon. I'm not saying that that's what God's thought is, but it, it is throughout you know, the Bible where you see that where somebody is taken out early because of the fact that they are not doing what they're supposed to. Well, I mean, think about King Saul. He is God's anointed. He, God you know, put him in place. And what ends up happening? I mean, he's doing well for the first you know, several years, but then he decides he wants to go do his own thing. And he gets, on, you know, gets himself in trouble. And then what does he end up doing? He ends up taking his own self out. He falls upon the sword, right? Now you, can't, now, you can't tell me that if Saul would have kept on doing what God had asked him to do, that he would have had a longer life, and he wouldn't have went out that way. But John said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 3, it says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That is, you know, living a life of holiness and a fear of God. That, that, that's what we should be doing, right? That we should be living a life of holiness and to have the fear of the Lord in our life. Not that we sit there and shudder like he's, he's some sort of abuse of God, but we, sh- we should realize that if we're not listening, he will rebuke us, he will chasten us, he will discipline us, right? The study of prophecy will, would and should purify our lives. Number two, Daniel was a man of prayer. We see this in, in uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 17. Also in, uh, in verse 23 of the second chapter. We see it in chapter 6. I'm just going to uh, read these off. I'm not going to like switch to them because I'll let you do that on your own time. So that way you're not flipping back and forth and miss something. But Daniel chapter 2, verse uh, 17 and uh, verse uh, 22 or sorry, 23, and then chapter 6, verse 10, chapter 9, verse 3, and also 19, and then also in chapter 10 you see this. But there are there's several incidents, uh, incidents recorded in, uh, in this book about Daniel's prayer life. By the way, Daniel got, you know, think about this. Prayer got Daniel into the lion's den. Prayer got Daniel into the lion's den. I mean, how would you like that for an answer to your prayers? Right? I mean, also, obviously, we know that God miraculously saved him from the, you know, from the lions, but Daniel was a man of prayer, and by him praying, that got him into the lion's den. And some of you are going, I don't know how much more praying I'm going to be doing tonight. I always tell people, be careful what you, uh, be careful what you pray for. I heard people say, well, you know, I need patience. I'm going to pray for patience. If you pray for patience, I'm just telling you not right now that there will be things in your life that are going to test your patience. Right? You're going to try your patience. Number three, Daniel was a man of prophecy. Daniel was a man of prophecy. Like I said, the, the, uh, the book of Daniel divides itself equally. The first, uh, the first half is history, and the last half of it is, is prophecy. Daniel gives us the skeleton of prophecy on which all prophecy is placed. The image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2 and also the beasts in Daniel chapter 7 are the backbone of prophecy. The, uh, the 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9 are like the ribs which fit into their proper place. The key verse to the book of Daniel, I, I say for, you know, for Daniel himself is in uh, verse 8, but this is the whole thing altogether is in Daniel chapter 2 verse 44. I will read this one. And it says, in, in the days of these kings. Here we have those. There we go. In the days of these, uh, of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom 
which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to, uh, to other people, but it, uh, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's basically the entire, like, that's the key verse of everything. Why? Because he's going to show how, how that God, you know, God's kingdom is never going to be destroyed. It will last forever. All those things through what? Through obviously, you know, through the history part in the first half of it and through the pro- uh, prophecy in the second half of it. The third one is this, the purpose of, of the writing, the purpose of this writing. I'm actually going quicker than I thought that I would. So if I need to slow down, just let me know. But obviously, in the dark hours of Israel's captivity, with the tragic destruction of Jerusalem and its temple, there was a need for a new testimony of the mighty and providential power of God, such is given us in the book of Daniel. Daniel is to the Old Testament what the book of Revelation is to the New Testament. In fact, we cannot fully understand the one without the other. That's why some people say, well, I read the book of Revelation, I cannot understand it. Well, if you ask them, have you read Daniel? You're not going to understand it without Daniel, and vice versa. If you read Daniel, but you haven't read Revelation, you're not going to you know, quite fully understand it. And I'm not saying that you're going to fully understand it, even if you read both. Okay? Uh, Dr. Uh, G. Campbell uh, Morgan put it this way. He said, he said uh, gave the, the theme of, for the book of Daniel. He said, persistent government of God in the government of the world. That's how he defined it. This book is the, uh, this is the book of the universal rule and authority of God. Prophecy is here interwoven with history to show that God is overruling idolatry, blasphemy, self-will, and intolerance of Gentiles. The reason why it's important to understand that the first half of it is history and the second half is prophecy is because you don't want to mix the two, right? You don't want to sit there and, you know, put prophecy, you know, along, you know, with the first part of it, you know, you just kind of, you put it, um, you kind of, you know, separate them a little bit uh, in those things. But Daniel deals with the times of the Gentiles, which is talked about in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. From Nebuchadnezzar to the Antichrist. That's what he's, he's spanning his whole thing is from Nebuchadnezzar to the Antichrist. Or the time when Israel is without her king. That period of time began in 606 B.C. with the captivity of Jerusalem and will end when Christ returns to earth to judge the Gentile nations and establish his kingdom. Let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And so what, we see, uh, what we're seeing here is obviously the fact that it is talking about that time period, that, that as we go, we're going to understand more, right? That our knowledge is going to be uh, increased. And just uh, in, 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 uh, look, go down a couple of verses down to verse 9. And this is where Daniel is going to ask him, you know, he's asked him, can I understand these things? Oh, actually, sorry, verse 8, he says, and I heard, but I understood not. And then said I, this is verse 8, O Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He wants to know what is going on. But verse 9 says this, and he said, go thy way, Daniel. Who is this? This is the Lord. Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the uh, time of the end. He says, you wrote all these things, you know, it spanned your entire 70 years and everything else. And you know what? You want to understand it, but it's not for you to understand. Now, I guarantee that if Daniel had the book of Revelation, he would have fully understood. He would have fully understood. But God said, it's not for you to know. That should also be comforting to us, you know, uh, for us, that maybe we come across a passage of scripture or a verse or whatever, and we don't understand what it means. Because we're not going to understand everything that the Bible says, right? And oftentimes, that's the reason why when you, uh, you read the Bible a hundred times, you said it, and you come back to it the hundred and first time, you're going, 
God must have just wrote that in there this morning because that was not there, you know, that was not there, you know, the last time I read it. You know, it's always been there. God just has not brought it to your attention yet, right? He hasn't revealed that to you. But the, uh, the book of Daniel, like I said, is the key to understanding other scriptures. I mean, Jesus in the Olivet Discourse quoted only from the book of Daniel. The book, uh, book of Revelation is largely an enigma or a, a mystery without the book of Daniel. You're not, like I said, you're not going to understand either one of them if you don't understand, if, if you're just trying to take one and separate it. They go together. Paul's revelation concerning the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 needs Daniel's account for, apple, uh, for amplification and clarification. We don't understand who the man of sin is until you read Daniel. And so you have to go, you go back and forth between the two. It's kind of like what I did with the abomination of desolation. I showed you that it was, you know, that it was talked about in uh, 2 Thessalonians, then I went over to uh, Revelation, but then I came back to Daniel. All those ones, they all go together. And they'll expl- they explain more and more as you go through them, right? That's how you understand those things. You say, well, Pastor, I'm lost already, and you're only doing the introduction and the, uh, and the background. Well, you know what? I'm going to try and make it as easy as I, you know, I possibly can as we go through those things. Obviously, the, you know, the first six chapters that we go through, you're going to sit there and go, I understand, you know, Daniel and the lions, and that's courage. You know, you need somebody to stand. I understand, you know, Mad Rag, Meshach, and Abednego. I understand that, you know. I don't even understand the fact that there was the four, you know, the fourth one, you know, in the fiery furnace, and that that was, you know, the Son of God, that that was an Old Testament appearing of Jesus. I understand. As you go, you know, when it gets more into pro- prophecy and stuff, you're going to sit there and go, I don't, I, I don't know. And it's okay to not understand certain things. I don't understand everything, okay? I'm telling you right there, you know, right there at the beginning that I don't understand something. So if I go on later on and I say, I don't know, you can't sit there and say, well, you knew it all. I just flat out told you, it said, I don't know everything. Let's look at some unique features of, of this book. Daniel has more to say about the tribulation and the Antichrist than any, old, than any other Old Testament book. So if you want to know what's going on in the Great Tribulation and the, uh, and the Antichrist, and you want to know about it from, from the Old Testament, go to the book of Daniel. It'll tell you. Daniel chapter 11 uh, includes a greater number of prophecies already fulfilled than any other single chapter in the Bible. That's why it's amazing. That's why you know you had uh, you had you know those, uh, you had different people wanting to uh, sit there and discount it and say, "Well, that can't be true. It has to be right around the same time because he has to be he has to be writing it after th- those events happened." No, he was writing them 400 years you know prior to. And they didn't like the fact that it was the Lord that was, that was opening his eyes to those things. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26, it marks the only Old Testament occurrence of the, uh, of a, of the Hebrew term, the Messiah or the Anointed One. That is the old, only Old Testament occurrence that, uh, that happens as in uh, Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. Daniel is the only Old Testament book to mention angels by name. He mentions Gabriel, who interpreted visions for Daniel. We see that in Daniel chapter 8, verse 16. And also in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. And Gabriel would later announce... Christ's birth to Mary. In Luke chapter 1, verse 19 and 26. The second one is Michael the archangel is seen here. And elsewhere in scripture as a spiritual warrior and defender of believers. We see this in Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. This is where Michael the archangel is. Also in uh, verse 21 of chapter 10. I don't quite see, uh, you know, uh, a paper smoking or anything else out there, so I'm thinking I'm going okay. (laughs) 
Uh, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, is also mentioned uh, Michael the archangel. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. And Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now there's a third angel that's mentioned in who can uh, who knows the last one There's only three of them you know announced in the Bible. Some of you like know it but you're afraid to say it because you think you got it wrong. It would be the fallen age, uh, angel Lucifer. And now all of a sudden you're going, "Yep, that's what I should have said. I know, I know." But so, except for the fallen angel uh, Lucifer, that's in Isaiah chapter fourteen, verse twelve. Gabriel and Michael are the only two angels mentioned by name in all all the scripture. So, obviously, besides the fallen angel Lucifer, you don't you don't ever get any other angel names besides Gabriel, Michael, and then Lucifer. But Lucifer was a fallen angel, so I don't know. I don't like to count him, so. But I, you know, I finished with like 15 minutes to spare. I am actually, you know, proud of myself. I actually thought that I was going to be, like, right up against, you know, that, you know, that point. So if you want to, you can uh, cut it, and then if you want 